you ever get the feeling that things are happening in which you have no say? That restrictions on your day-to-day -day life seem to be increasing, often by illogical rules and regulation. Ever thought that someone else was controlling things? Someone remote, unseen, unaccountable. Yes? Well, you're not alone in your thoughts. Our country is effectively being governed remotely by the Parliament of the European Union, severely restricting Britain's independence. They are literally controlling your lives. No one's ever told us before the fact that 75% of the laws by which we live every year aren't made in Westminster, aren't made by the MPs we vote for, they're made by these Brussels institutions. Literally everything from whether our local post office is going to close to a collection of bins is decided here in Brussels. And it's the story that nobody wants you to know. 100,000 new regulations have come into force since 1973 as a direct result of Britain's EU membership. These rules cover a range of domestic issues such as immigration and asylum policy, energy policy, transport, health and safety and VAT to name a few. They are zealously enforced by our own bureaucrats, many of whose salaries are paid from your council tax and business rates. The EU's power was set to be extended with the creation of the EU constitution, the foundation for a very powerful European superstate. But two years ago, the people of France and the Netherlands had a referendum on that proposed EU constitution. It was roundly rejected and stopped the constitution in its tracks, or so we thought. Undaunted, the EU have ignored democracy and pushed forward with an alternative. And right now, the situation has never been more urgent. We have before us what they call the Lisbon Treaty, but really, it's the old EU constitution, reheated and repackaged. If it passes, it will give the European Union the ability to legislate literally over every single aspect of our lives. The aim of this video is to illustrate the far-reaching control exercised by the Parliament of the European Union and the imminent changes that will irrevocably alter the independent state of the United Kingdom. Britain is an overcrowded island and our infrastructure is no longer coping. In the league table of top 10 economies, England is the most densely populated, even beating Japan, India and China. Our graph of population growth has received a very significant increase in the last few years, courtesy of EU Directive 2004-38, formally opening UK borders to any EU citizens to come to work live and build their families in the UK and enjoy the benefits of a state welfare system unrivaled in the EU. On paper this seems fair and every other EU state is supposed to receive migrants. Yet amongst the other EU countries the UK is at the top of yet another table, that of receiving more migrants than any other EU country, even though we're the country least able to cope with such a sudden population explosion. We're also the least able to cope with the strain imposed on housing provision, health services, transportation infrastructure, well, the list goes on. Official figures have been repeatedly shown to be woefully inaccurate. The signs of uncontrolled population growth are already evident throughout the UK. And it's not just restricted to the cities. Have you noticed, no matter where you live, how often you're in traffic jams compared to, say, three years ago? had problems getting your children into chosen schools, seen cutbacks in local health services. It is putting a, putting a strain on services, of course it is, because there are more people coming into the, uh, to, into the country, but there doesn't seem to be any more funding. So, of course, it, something's got to break somewhere. I think it is a worry. Drain on resources, much more crowded, things going up, and, yeah, it's a concern. Our population is growing and we're getting immigrants 
from uh, North Europe coming in and increasing the population. You, and where do we put all the houses? You're getting more and more houses, you know where to put them. Especially the traffic on the roads is full, it's too much. It's definitely going to be a strain on it because there are more people in demand for it as well. Yes, you look around, we've got all our motorways. Uh, it's, it's beginning to get like a car park everywhere in the roads, our pollution, everything about this country now is not good news at all. I'm worried already, so <laughs> it's a big worry, isn't it? I'm worried for my children and my grandchildren now. It has affected us. And it concerns you? Yes, it does, a lot. In fact, so much so I'm thinking of leaving, doing the opposite. These comments are not isolated views. In a recent survey, 59% of people said that membership of the EU prevents Britain from controlling immigration. 80% of people say they want immigration controlled now. Clearly, something has to be done. But the UK government appears powerless in the face of Brussels. It is set to get worse. The right of entry into Britain has been granted to all states, including the newest EU members, such as Bulgaria, Romania, Latvia, Slovakia, Slovenia to name but a few. Migration from these Eastern European countries has been growing at an unprecedented rate and Turkey with a population of over 70 million is waiting in the wings for acceptance into the EU. Have you ever wondered why the cost of sending a letter has increased so much recently? Or why you're now charged nearly 75% more for sending an A4 letter, even though it weighs no more than a standard size envelope? Well, we can thank EU Directive 9767. They came up with this new system in a drive towards achieving harmony of European postal services so that we in the UK could benefit from, well, lower prices. What it meant in practice was that the Royal Mail had to open up its business mail services to foreign competition like Deutsche Post, which has now muscled in on the lucrative bits of Royal Mail's market, but leaving poor old postman Pat with the unprofitable domestic postal deliveries, trying desperately to keep the costs viable, but without the profit from its business post to keep it afloat. I think we'd all agree that post offices play a vital role in keeping communities alive. Indeed, without the post office counter services, many rural shops like this one would be forced to close. And yes, the government acknowledges this and has set in place subsidies to ensure post offices can stay open. But our partners in Brussels have been meddling again. Here's EU Directive 2002-39. The EU Parliament insists that the size of the postal market reserved for national monopolies must be reduced and that the UK government must seek permission before any state aid is granted. As a result of this, back in 2003, the government signed away the Royal Mail's ability to control its own financial affairs and a deal was struck which allowed the government to grant £150 million to the post office each year for three years. However, the cost of running the postal service is £208 million a year, which means there's a £58 million annual deficit. The government does not have permission from the EU to increase the grant, and so the debt is increasing, and matters will only get worse as inflation rises. Result? Closure of post offices all over the country. The bottom line? You, the government and Postman Pat have lost control over the future of our post offices. Let's talk about what we get from the EU. Every year, the UK contributes a huge amount of money into the European Union. How much? Well, just imagine I'm on my way to Brussels with our payment for the year. This UK truck is full to bursting. 14 billion pounds of taxpayers' money. OK, let's go. Obviously, our friends across in France make a similar journey each year. When everyone gets to Brussels, their contributions are redistributed to fund all the EU activities throughout the Union. The UK, for example, 
takes back around four billion pounds for various EU funded projects plus a rebate more about that later so when we set off back to Blighty with our EU cash it requires a smaller truck and there's Henri with his rebates back off to Paris but he appears to be in the same truck as he arrived in so what's going on there it appears Henri returns to France with 98% of his contributions, the bulk of which is destined for the French farmers as part of their common agricultural policy deal. Because historically, it's always been that way. This situation has continued for many years and it's set to get worse. So far, the UK has contributed £300 billion, pounds, of which only £66 billion has been spent directly in the UK. I just think they take the mickey out of us, basically. Um, I, especially it's common agricultural policy. I don't think uh, that's right. It should be worked out again or they shouldn't have it. That's my feeling, that, that, that we sort of play cricket in this country and um, <laughs> I feel what they don't necessarily. Kind of get screwed over, I guess, don't we? Spending that much money, what do we get out of it? Not much. The hard-won rebates that Mrs Thatcher negotiated many years ago were surrendered last year by Tony Blair. Add to that the funding for the newest members to the EU club and we're in for some very expensive years ahead. Finally, the UK is putting more effort into eco-friendly ways of disposing of our rubbish and recycling is becoming second nature to many of us. This has resulted in reduced levels of domestic waste going into precious landfill sites like this. As usual, the EU is driving to encourage recycling, not through incentives nor education, but with a new tax. And the culprit here is EU Directive 1999-31. Another weighty contribution to the tip. It dictates that by 2020, around half of UK household waste must be diverted from landfills. The EU has imposed a UK landfill tax of £32 for every tonne of waste your council brings here. The impact of this EU intervention has been felt here and is one of the reasons why your council tax has gone up and why collections around many parts of the country have been reduced to once a fortnight. Worryingly, some councils are now resorting to installing computer chips in wheelie bins in preparation for charging individuals for the rubbish they put in their bins. And it will get worse. From 2010, the landfill tax will have increased substantially, set to be between £100 and £150 per tonne. Someone has to pay this tax, and it'll probably be you. This is the seat of their power, the European Parliament in Brussels. And just for good measure, there's a second campus at Strasbourg, at the request of the French. Witness the process of EU democracy, legislating over the detail of every aspect of life within EU states, often with voting schedules so intense that they abandon electronic voting with the inevitable chaos and mistakes. No amendments in favour against abstentions has carried. Congratulations to the rapporteur. Next, Mr Blockland's report. Batteries and accumulators and waste batteries and accumulators. So proposal for a directive. Two amendments, two blocks. Block one, compromise, all in favour. Against, abstentions, has carried. Yesterday, yesterday we had the President of the Parliament tell us that it was acceptable to make a number of mistakes in getting the vote wrong because we're voting so fast it's impossible to see how people are voting anyway. Can you please slow down? Cher collègue. Dear colleagues, well let me just show you what we've got to get through today. I'm sorry, but you know, we're never going to get through it if we don't proceed at pace. This is hardly the way a democratic organisation should conduct its business let alone one that controls a union of states governing around 500 million people. In a recent survey, only one in ten people questioned said they believe the EU is accountable, and that was before they knew about the Lisbon Treaty.
the Lisbon Treaty affects every bit of life in the UK and in all other community countries. Every democratic and legal safeguard for which we've lived for centuries in our country is now literally under threat by this new treaty. This Lisbon Treaty, or what was the rejected EU constitution, has been quietly resurrected and its ratification carefully stage managed to ensure it gets the vital signatures of member states. The level of subterfuge can be revealed by studying the comments of the authors of the constitution. Valérie Giscard d'Estaing is quoted as saying that public opinion will be led to adopt, without knowing it, the proposals that we dare not present to them directly. All the earlier proposals will be in the new text, but will be hidden and disguised. As the former Italian Prime Minister Giuliano Amato put it, the good thing about not calling it a constitution is no one can ask for a referendum on it. Nicolas Sarkozy is clear. The project of our founding fathers is complete. The economic union is becoming a political union. Gordon Brown presented a different view of the Constitution. It is not as though this is being imposed on our country. People will have the chance to put their views. Have you ever heard of the Lisbon Treaty? I've heard of it. I don't know very much about it. No. No, I haven't, no. No. No, I haven't, no. No. No, I haven't. No. I have, but I don't know what it was about. I've heard of Lisbon, I've heard of a treaty, but not a Lisbon treaty. With the electorate now excluded from the process, the required politician signatures were all that was needed. Some secured even before the treaty had been published. Incredible. Prime ministers, foreign ministers, take a decision that a text they want to propagate as uh, improved democracy should not be read by any citizen before it has been finally approved. Sign! Don't read. That's the message of the Prime Ministers and the Foreign Ministers. In my view, it's illegal. If you're outraged by these activities in Brussels, then you're not alone. In a survey conducted last year, people were asked about their views on the EU Constitution. 90% want the opportunity to vote on a new EU constitution. 72% of people think the EU constitution would not benefit the UK. And 77% think that whether we want it or not, the politicians will probably introduce it through the back door anyway. Indeed, a majority believe that despite what politicians say, it is inevitable that the UK will lose the pound and adopt euros. This all seems a far cry from the optimism of the 1970s, when UK citizens were assured they were joining a European trading group called the Common Market. 30 years on, and the situation's very different. The people of the UK have ended up being governed by a foreign parliament, and the promised safety net of the right to veto has been completely eroded. We're not allowed to vote. Um, we're not allowed to have a referendum. Our government are just browbeaten by them, and I think they're a disaster. So is that fair? If it's a union giving you equality, where's the equality? We should have our own laws in, it, in this country, and um, it shows up more and more. I think we have lost control. I don't think we've got any control now. I think a lot of people feel very strongly about it. Well, that really does concern me, yes, because there really is a terrific loss of control, you know, and that really does concern me, yes. It is frightening because um, I feel that we're becoming a United States of Europe. We're going to be a state, not a country, even though we are an island. The UK government has lost control of its country and those given control appear not to have the confidence nor trust of those people whose lives are changed by their decisions. This is another element in this Lisbon Treaty, that it's the last treaty which can be put for a referendum. Why? Because it includes in Article 48, P7 and 6, the most important uh, part of it, a self-amending clause. It means that Prime Ministers can meet, and when they then meet, they can decide an amendment to the treaty, which shall not be put for voters in any member state. They decided on their own. 
Well, anyone that watches this and says, surely it's not right that all our laws are made here by these institutions, what they must do is they must write to their MP and tell him or her they'll never vote for them again if they continue to allow 75% of our laws to be made here by these institutions and worse still, to ratify this new treaty, this new EU constitution without a referendum. And if that doesn't work, well in the future what people must do is to vote for different parties, parties that say let's be friendly with Europe, let's trade with Europe, but for goodness sake let's make our own laws and govern our own country.